Hi everyone, welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan, and on this episode of Wandering DMs, we're going to be talking about bards. Uh, how have they been presented through the editions of D&D? Uh, how are they tied into historical texts, texts? And exactly how thirsty do you like them? All that and more today on Wandering DMs. <laughs> welcome to the show, Paul. Huh? <laughs> how thirsty do you like them? Excellent, excellent. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I want to start with this. So we, so bards, you know, it's interesting. Bards have been in most editions of D and D, actually, not mm -hmm. all of them, and I guess we'll get to that. And so one of the things that I thought was really interesting, from you know my old school perspective, is the very first Dragon magazines that I ever got as a kid uh, had an article about bards and actually trying to retune them a bit based on what the class had been before. Uh, this was in uh, Dragon number 56, I think, from 1981, written by a man named Jeff Geltz. And kind of common at the time, it starts with this opening dialogue between some in-world characters. Uh, and so this is a point where um, they're going to be talking at one point about the original D&D bar that came in a, in, a, uh, in a magazine article. And they're going to be talking about the first edition, a D&D bar that came in the player's handbook as an option. And I think it's a very illuminating conversation between the characters. So I figured I'd just kind of read this, this couple of passages here. So this is a conversation of a DM with two NPCs. There's Jake Armageddon, a half-orc fighter assassin, and Jake's brother Alphonse, who is a cleric assassin. I love that they're both DM. assassins. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah. Of course. Half -orc they're both half-orcs and assassins. Yeah, great. Right? Okay. So the DM says, guys, I'm glad you could come. I want your opinion on a particular subject. Jake says, go ahead, boss. What you want to talk about? DM, um, bards. The two valiant half-orcs immediately run into the nearest corner, cowering and whimpering. Alphonse says, ah, it hurts us. It hurts us, the nasty DM. Don't worry. I'm not going to bring one here right now. I just wanted to talk about them. So Jake and Alphonse apprehensively come back from the corner. Jake says, Boss, bards are just plain mean. Me and Alfie will probably be in the running for Guildmaster pretty soon now, but those bard guys could lick the tar out of both of us. DM says, which ones are worse, the old type bards or the newer type ones? And Jake says, well, I tell ya, I'd rather run into a division of Sherman tanks than the old ones, and the newer ones are just as bad, except nowadays, there sure are less of them, because it takes so long to become one. Alphonse, ax, nasty boards! And the DM says, Jake, where'd you learn about Sherman Tanks? <laughs> uh, so, delightfully like rooted in the, uh, in the old right? school there with the references to Sherman Tanks, I feel like, because clearly our audience is, is war gamers who are, you know, well, well established. Uh, uh, and tank battalions. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Go on. Now, how many, how many like modern players that have you know picked up D and D in the last couple of years would immediately think of bards as worse than platoon of Sherman tanks? <laughs> I feel like that's that might be a, a rather a rather sh shocking uh, conception, but that's how they were uh, considered originally in zero or first edition days. Hmm. hmm. Oh, uh, okay, so I have uh, uh, some feedback from a user here that says, uh, oh, wait, looks like we were having a little little technical trouble there streaming to YouTube. Sorry, folks, but I guess it's, it seems to awesome. work itself out. So Great. I'm going to stop talking about that. Go on, Dan. Zip zap. Thank you for checking on that, actually. Yeah. That's, we appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, so that, for, that's actually a really f uh, fun little piece in my heart. And uh, so uh, Mr. Geltz there in that article uh, presented a, a possibly revised. The, the title of the article is... Uh, 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 bards not so hard is what it is. So uh, uh, an offering of a not completely power game breaking version of the bard at the time that anybody could start off with. And as uh, that being my, my very first edition of Dragon Magazine that always really struck a chord with me, uh, big thanks to a couple of our patrons who, because I, I couldn't remember which, which edition that was in actually, but a couple of our patrons on our Discord helped me find that again. So big thanks for that. Is that Paul? Is that your like normal conception of bards that they're just, they completely break the game? <laughs> they destroy every other class, and they're worse than a Sherman tank. Uh, no, no, that is not my my 
my use uh, of bards. Although, uh, you know, I've been I've been struggling actually to think back about how often I've used bards. Certainly, I've been aware of bards since uh, the beginning of of the game, uh, or the beginning of my experience playing the game. But um, I'm trying to think of cases where I've actually seen them in play and actually like engaged with them, and I feel like it's pretty rare. Um, uh, which, which, which that does line up with, uh, with, uh, what Jake has to say there about, uh, you know, about them being less of them. They're so hard. Yeah. And, and one thing, and I, I agree. I was thinking the same thing and I haven't seen too many bards in my games as well, historically. And, um, you know, part of the reason for that is they were always marked strongly as optional, mm. uh, when you and I were learning the game, they're not in basic, they're not in mold. They, they're not in Beck me at all. Yep. Um, and they were marked as optional all the way up until third edition. And it wasn't until third edition of the game, mm -hmm. which for you and me was a little bit later, that they were a core normal class as equitable as fighters or wizards or something like that. So when, when you and I were growing up with the game, they, they were largely fenced off and to a large degree off yep. limits, actually. Yep. I, I believe that that conversation with the two half arcs would have gone quite differently if you were talking about first edition versus third edition bards. Um, because I think that by the time you get into third edition and, and then eventually fourth, fifth, that bards are very different from what they were in the old school. Right, right, I agree. Um, and so, like, I think that, you know, you and I, so I think the first time that we ever had a PC bard was when you and I were playing third edition. And my best guess is I think our friend Joe had one mm. at that point. Again, once it, I think when third edition came out, there were a lot more options and races and classes that were previously either fenced off or hard to achieve for certain reasons. Um, and so there was kind of this uh, rush to test out all the different classes that you hadn't gotten to use previously. Mm. And I certainly remember the main thing that I remember is because I think at the time the Bard had a free like plus one to your allies attacks all the time, as long as you were singing. And so we get into a habit of every single combat, we were yelling at the bard character, uh, bard song, bard song, bard song, bard song, <laughs> all the time. We yeah. try to remember them to, to say that, yeah. uh, which was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's the main thing I remember. Now, you know, other people dig into the bards, you know, maybe a lot more than, than we do, of course. So. A couple of weeks back, we had the opportunity to talk to Satine Phoenix and Jameson Stone um, about their really successful Kickstarter for Siren's Battle of the Bards, where they're setting up an entire campaign around kind of bards as rock stars to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. That was really impressed me by really how successful that was, to be perfectly frank. So I think that was episode 19 of the season. And if somebody didn't have the opportunity after this show, they should go back and, and watch our interview with Satine and Jameson. Uh, building an entire campaign around bards. And then we also had a, um, a really great follower on Twitter, uh, who I believe is the GM of the, the Headless Dragons group. And the other day they wrote on Twitter, they said, I love bards and built a whole campaign around them. Although they are dark entities with horrific power, mythical creatures to be feared. Um, and as they gain mastery in their campaign, uh, he writes, as they gain mastery over their instruments, they graft on additional limbs as they progress to more complicated instrument designs requiring more limbs. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can't say I've ever seen right? that one, but that's great. That's yeah. Great. I kind of like that a lot. I, and I, I like it. It's, to me, it feels very old school of bards being kind of fearsome, kind of the, the apex predator of the game, uh, mm -hmm. really tied into the root of, of power ultimately. And to me, that feels very that feels very old schooly, and I like I kind of like those ideas a lot. Mm. I've never had the opportunity to build a campaign entirely around bards, but I totally get it. I mean, never mind building a campaign around it. I wonder if in in your current old school games, you you notice their lack. Do you want to reintroduce them? Um, you know, if you were playing a, a running one of your games, and one of your players came to you and said, "I really want to play a bard," could you find a way to incorporate that? I, okay, th that that's probably the primary way that that would probably happen. Is if I had a player bring it up, then I then I might actually look for a way to work it in. It would not be available at first level. Mm -hmm. It would not be something that you can can come into the game as a neophyte bard who's uh, a goofball in the bar. 
Um, I would want something a little bit more dramatic and a little bit more dangerous than that. But I think for me, possibly at like a higher level, I might actually consider giving that as an option someday. Yeah. I feel like I would rather... Generally, my brain is usually in like the setting of the game. Right? Like how much is, is it trying to be... You know, what are the literary influences? How much is it trying yes. to be uh, historically you know, referential of, of a time period? Um, so like one of the things I keep thinking of is where, like if I, where in appendix N am I going to find a bar? That's a really good question. Um, I didn't dig into that enough. I mean, maybe one of our viewers has an idea about that. I'm not sure there's any, any actual Gygaxian appendix N that's particularly on that. I, w I will say in a couple of weeks, we will have the opportunity to talk to Peter Berbigal, who is the editor of a book called Appendix N. The Eldritch nice. Roots of D&D. &D. And so if, if we come up empty, maybe we can ask Peter Berbergal in a couple couple of weeks and maybe he'll have a better idea. So, so correct me um, if I'm wrong, though, but that, that lack of, like, a, of literary influence is one of your strongest arguments, I think, for not having clerics in your game. I agree with that. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Now, and the, other th the interesting thing you're, you're tapping into is that the story of the bards in D&D &D is very much the story of how much do the writers specifically cite historical sources? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, when, I, when I dug into the, the very first appearance of the Bard for d and I was very interested because it starts off with several paragraphs of historical citations to motivate and support the design of this particular class. And so that was written by Doug Schwegman originally, uh, and it appeared in the sixth issue of uh, Tactical Studies Rules magazine. Uh, back in 1976. So this was about two years after the first ever publication of D&D. &D. And he's got a preamble that cites scalds and bards and minstrels and Greek poets and Tolkien, specifically citing one particular chant by Bilbo on the ancient mariner. And in particular, what Schwegman uh, leans into is he says, in the Celtic system, bards were trained by the Druids for a period of almost 20 years before they assume their duties, among which was to follow the heroes in the battle, to provide an accurate account of their deeds, as well as to act as trusted intermediaries to settle hostilities among opposing tribes. And, uh, and then when he actually gets into describing what our class is going to be like, uh, here's his opening, which I thought was interesting. He says, a bard is a jack of all trades in Dungeons and Dragons. He is both an amateur thief and magic user, as well as a good fighter. He is supposedly able to extract himself from delicate situations through the use of diplomacy. But since this does not always work, he is given the innate ability to charm creatures as well. And so a couple of interesting things there is that the very first sentence of the description uses the phrase jack of all trades. Yep. And um, I think it was William a couple of minutes ago in our chat. That's the first when he when we said bards, that was kind of the first thing that popped into his head was jack of all trades type bard. And you still see that language today because even in 5th edition D&D, that is specifically one of the class features of bards. It's called Jack of All Trades, where they get to apply half of their proficiency bonus to any skill in the game at all. Um, so that idea that was laid down by uh, Schwegman in 1976 is, has a direct line to the game today. And the other thing is that He's basically, a the bard at this time is a combination of all the character classes in the game. The fighter, the thief, the magic user. Mm -hmm. Not the cleric, because who cares about that? And the cleric isn't really essential to D&D in the first place. So, of course, that wasn't part of it. But the important ones, they're all there. The <laughs> bard's all of them, right? <laughs> all right. And I'm out. My drop. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> well, let's let's. Let, I want to go back to the discussion of how we've used bards in our campaigns because I have a, a kind of an, a weird, obtuse one, which which uh, meshes in with how I would how I would like to see bards used in my own games, um, and 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 you know, kind of my flip my answer to the question of like if somebody came to me in my current campaign and said I want to play a bard, this is the direction I would I would nudge them, uh, which is basically I don't want a special class for them. Uh, I will lean back on my favorite ever OD&D uh, anecdote. Uh, this is like fourth hand, so this may be pure pure legend. But uh, uh, the story goes that someone uh, is running a, a white box OD&D game at a convention, and a player comes up and says, ooh, original D&D, that's awesome. I super want to play. Uh, and the DM says, great, come, come join us. And he says, I want to be a thief. And the DM says, well, of course, in OD&D, there is no thief. 
right? It's fighting man, magic user, cleric. That's it. And the player says, oh, but I love thieves. I really want to play a thief. And the DM says, so steal something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in my long-running BX campaign, uh, which is originally, uh, actually before it was BX, we were, I was running it in Labyrinth Lord, um, uh, some players wanted to explore things like rangers and paladins, which I'm used to playing those. I'm used to seeing those in first edition, um, right. and, and those feel like like strong archetypes to me. And so I think I ended up looking up and finding some uh, third party um, supplements where somebody wrote like, "Here's expansion rules for getting paladins and and uh, and rangers into your into your labyrinth lord game." Um, now, meanwhile, our friend BJ wanted to play a character based on. Uh, a literary source, uh, which was the... I'm not going to remember the actual character's name because I never read the books, but he's a kind of a... Uh, it's not really uh, quite the, the era or the setting you would you would think of normally because he's like an Appalachian kind of mountain man who had a silver string mandolin and um, was just kind of this this uh, man of God, basically. So his his powers, uh, his abilities were were, you know religious in nature and he roamed around with this silver string mandolin and uh, did, did good deeds and um i'm sure i'm screwing up the actual original source of the character but that's what he wanted to play and so what we came up with was to have him play uh joshua tells me it's john the balladeer thank you joshua um that he would play a cleric that he would play a cleric and his holy symbol would be a silver string mandolin and so he brought that into play quite a bit in the game. He would he would use it. He would use his mandolin to turn the undead. Right. He would use his mandolin to cast his spells. Um, he also conveniently took up this habit of blogging about the sessions, and and did such an amazing job of it. I eventually ended up printing out and and making a hardcover book out of it as this lovely little uh, memento of that campaign because it's just this glorious story. So so he was also kind of you know the storyteller of the group. He was the one who was documenting. But as you said. Right, was there to witness the events and to record them for for history, uh, and he was totally doing that. Uh, so it felt very bardish to me, but never did we ever call that character a bard. Okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah. I tend, to, I personally tend to be a little bit more shy about reskinning classes than a lot of people. Mm. I tend to want, I tend to want it to be hooked into a specific campaign. <clears throat> source, I guess, whether it be wizards from a university, hypothetically clerics with a specific existing pantheon of deities mm -hmm. or something like that. So I tend to, if there's going to be a new source of power, then I would, I would tend to want to actually roll out a specific path role to represent that. So this but, is, this is, um, the, now, now we're going to, we're going to, make a hard left turn into the into the cleric discussion here unfortunately but um <laughs> my approach to clerics in my campaigns has always right. been that i want my players to have <clears throat> impact and input into right. the setting um yeah. to the point of i don't have a pantheon i've never had a pantheon right uh, i say right. there are many many gods there are just tons of them there you're always hearing about new and being like what i never heard about that right. god before so when a player in my game wants to play a cleric i say great tell me about your god you make it up please i'm not going to give you a list of options you tell me about your god and we're going to incorporate that into the setting um, I forgive your heresy. Um, <laughs> you, you, you have a lot of advanced credit, so oh, I will. Oh, uh, wait, I'll sorry. let that go. I'm seeing uh, Joshua has corrected himself. Uh, Manly Wade Wellman was the name of that character who played a silver string guitar, and that absolutely sounds right to me. I'm sure I heard BJ okay. talk about Manly Wade Wellman. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, right. Yep. That that is absolutely the character who is the, his was based on. So that's what I love, honestly. Like again, in this day, if I was going to run a campaign. And somebody told me they wanted to do paladins or rangers. I still love those options, but I probably wouldn't incorporate a whole new class for them. I would just say, "Well, oh, you're a fighter or you're a cleric, and you happen to belong to this organization, or you happen to worship this particular god." Um, and like I, because I like the 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 organizational side of rangers and paladins, um, and I just don't see a reason to have a whole special class for them. I broadly agree with that. I broadly agree with that, and. You know, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, now my heresy is that I actually kind of like the third edition idea of feats, which is now, you know, become a vestigial option in fifth edition, of course. But I, that's, that's the one thing that I've liked is a fairly lightweight way of tuning the fighter characters 
in mm. directions like that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, like in my game, pardon me, <clears throat> I give, uh, you know, trackings a feat, right, is mm. one of the options. Um, you could, uh, I could imagine adding uh, a particular favored enemy or something like that. Yep. And so those little tweaks to make someone come off as a paladin or ranger are fairly lightweight. They don't break the game a lot. Um, <clears throat> and I, I kind of like that. So I would, I would, my initial stab would be some kind of, and, and personally, I also like multi-classing, which again is, is another vestigial option in fifth edition now is I like the ability to take a small number of existing classes and mix and match them yep. in a geometric number of interesting combinations. Yep. And so I think that like for, for to come, bring it back to bards who are fairly complicated, I think that's that's probably how I would go about them is I'd yep. maybe have an in cam in campaign organization and then they have to go through a number of a number of different phases of training to actually become become a bard. So if we're looking at, uh, okay, Joshua, I'm going to give you one last on-screen correction here because uh, he keeps correcting me. And, and he's right, I'm sure, because I never really followed this. I always just trusted BJ. Uh, Manly Wade Wellman, I guess, was the name of the author. Oh, okay. There you go. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, but I All feel right. like that is such a memorable name. I'm certain I heard BJ say it. Right, right, right. Okay. Right. So um, to go back to this notion of... Um, <laughs> Um, I know not everybody likes feats or multi-classic. Yeah, I yeah, get it. Feats. Well, well I, mean, I found like, them to be so, useful. So do you want to add a bard song feat? Would you add a bard song feat for the purpose of this character? This theoretical Probably character. not because it doesn't feel fightery enough to me. I would pro I might roll out new spells. New right? spells. There so you I go. feel like the way that the way yeah. that, 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 that that's easy and compatible to expand magical options is new spells, new spells. that hadn't been noticed or researched yeah. before yeah. so that's it definitely the way I'd go about it. yeah so that's that's i think the fascinating thing because this gets into that era that that the region of the discussion of like jack of all trades versus mm -hmm. music via magic right or, sorry magic via music um mm -hmm. right At, the, the description you've given so far of old school bards is really heavily into the sort of jack of all trades area and which leaves me wondering well when did music get involved is it just because the word bard for some reason implies to us music and we start thinking of like medieval troubadours um where does the music come in okay that is very <laughs> much i mean that's that's cited by again that's cited by schweigman and he he mentions Tolkien when bilbo's singing the song of the ancient mariner right um so if you dig into the 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 mythology of specifically irish bards uh so actually you know i think a lot of this comes from a particular book by Joseph Walker called Historical Memoirs of the Irish Bards. And I think the subtitle has something, something, music, something, something mm. to it. And he published that in 1786. How it's kind of, a you know, like a lot of stuff at the time, it's kind of a mishmash of fables and myth and history. And it's kind of hard to disentangle it. But um, among the, you know, the what were bards for, um, at least at a, at a late era, um, there were uh, three professions. Okay, so once you graduate and you became a full bard in Ireland, higher, you know, highly uh, honored. And in fact, uh, one of the kings laid down seven social castes, right? Seven social castes to the culture of Ireland. And at the very top was the royal family. And second, only the royal family were were bards. Mm. And everybody else came after them: generals and marshals and police and hospitaliers and merchants, everybody was below that. But the second to top, to highest level was bards led only, you know, only above that was the royal family themselves. And um, so there were, at that time, there were three, allegedly three professions. There was, and my, my Celtic's terrible, so I'm going to mangle the pronunciations here. So one, there was the Olamain, who were poets and heralds and the chiefs who were, the, they were always with the chiefs at the head of the armies. Um, two, there were the Brethamine, who were wandering legislators and judges. Mm. So they had to memorize all of the laws of the land. And since this was an oral tradition, how did they do it? Through epic poetry. So they were, they were trained through epic poetry to remember the laws. And basically, they wandered around Ireland like a bunch of Judge Dreads. So they, they they knew the laws and they laid down justice and and they they were in charge and nobody else could could naysay them. And then there were also and then third and last there were the 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 Shana Hadith, 
um, who were historians and genealogists and antiquarians. And to me, that sounds a lot like Indiana Jones. <laughs> but the whole, the whole core of that is that they were known to be uh, poets and they, you know, they sang the stories, they remembered the laws. There actually was a law at one point where only bards were allowed to sing funeral rites, which was a major part of their, their support status. So definitely part of the history and definitely part of the D&D &D class ever since the start in OD&D, &D, where they had this special charm ability. So it specifically said as long as they are chanting or singing, they have this special charm ability where anybody in 60 feet has to make a saving throw or be mesmerized. Yep. And then the bard can also hit them with a suggestion spell if that works. So that's, that's, that's always been part of it. See, and that's so interesting. I, mean, I guess it's because of that. And then, and then game designers with their game balance hats on getting at that and saying like, well, the tradition is that bards are always singing and we want to include that as part of the, the flavor of being a bard that you then end up with bard song, right? And, and bards start right. to take on this, this support role, right? Because that's the interesting thing to me is that starting in third edition and moving forward, you end up with more and more with bards in this very interesting kind of support role where the cliche now is that bards, all bards do is kind of stand in the back and, and, and sing and play the guitar and give everyone a plus one. Right. Which feels right. really weak compared to, you know, where they used to be. Right. I agree. Fascinating. I agree. Fascinating. But I will say the modern audience seems to really love them and loves that notion of uh, the performative aspect of it, right? Like that seems to be very popular. Uh, my other major anecdote of of bards comes from um, Dan. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, maybe you weren't there. I can't remember. But anyway, we were at PAX when we, that one time we went to um, oh yes PAX Unplugged. And running games, and nearby was uh, a, a young lady who, on uh, Twitter, I think, goes by the Opera Geek, um, and was playing a bar in a game. Kelly something, if I'm yeah. not if I'm not misremembering, I, I think. I believe that's correct. Right. Um, and um, and and was you know clearly playing a bard and has a background in opera singing, and so like actually like we were in mid game and suddenly operatic uh, <laughs> vocalization happening in the next table over that was immediately like uh, you know hard hard to miss for everyone else in the in the uh, in the room and uh, a little uh, round of applause at the end of that and I'm sure it was very immersive and exciting in their game and I, I and there's no judgment here for me I thought it, I thought it was hilarious at the moment I was, was excited to see it happen um, because I like that in general I, I think if you're gonna play a bard I mean you should you know should bring something to the table, some poems. Yeah. Some, that that some, was, some, I mean, that wasn't just something. their table. There was, there were twenty tables in the in the uh, convention room, and everybody stopped playing. Yeah, because everybody stopped playing, <laughs> like mouth agape. Yeah, uh, as she did a full on area or something out loud, standing up, and everybody was was amazed. And I think she got a round of applause. Yeah, at the end of it, it was totally amazing. You know, it's interesting because I follow um, I follow uh, Kelly on Twitter actually. And, you know, as someone who is a performer, you know, a live performer, you know, like the past year and a half has been particularly difficult. And my friends that have, uh, you know, rock bands and things like that or stand up comedians or things like that has been very, very difficult as they've basically just been, you know, chilling their heels, unfortunately, yeah. not being able to perform live in front of an audience. And for some people that has been very difficult. And I, I, I'm looking forward to all my friends and the opera geek getting back on stage where they belong. Oh, for sure, uh, for sure. Soon, um, and my, I, I, I have a lot of sympathies for the the people that are that are yearning to get back to that. And the other thing I will say, you know, as someone who is, um, you know, people who are, um, you know, get attention and are very talented performers and very attractive, uh, you know, occasionally on social media there are people that get, you know, unfortunate unfair criticisms of maybe being not real D&Ders. And I think back to that particular, that particular convention game where they're, they're, they're right side by side with us in the middle of the game and they just break out into an opera area. Yeah. And I'm like, that's the, that's the realest gamer I've ever seen perhaps. Yeah. 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 So I yeah. have, we, that, that's really hard evidence that yeah. that's, that, uh, that uh, many, many different kinds of people really love, 
really love our game, and I'm glad that they're all there myself. Yeah, for sure. sure. It's it's fascinating because because in general, my reaction to bards as a as a you know mechanically is a bit negative. I have to admit that I'm like I don't I don't need special rules for them. Uh, do they even belong in the milieu? I don't know. I can't. It's hard for me to think of literary sources that feature them. The history you're talking about, like, I don't know if if that's the history that we're that we're that we're trying to promote in our games. Where are all the NPC bards, right? Where are all the where are all the modules that feature a king with his bard, you know, side by side, and that's important to the story, or at least that they play a part or a role in the game in some way. That's like it's just not present. It's not present. Instead, what we get is here's a group of adventurers who are either you know out to save the world or or just out to make a buck depending on what kind of campaign you're running and one of them happens to be carrying a loot right <laughs> and i think that they how what on the other hand uh um i love the idea of a character type who's built into their backstory or their their just their their characterization my character performs in this way they're a singer they're a uh a, a, a musician they're a, a, a poet they're a you know, stand-up comic. <laughs> they're a, they're a, a sculptor. They're a whatever, right? They're a, they're whatever performance they do, and then actually bringing it into the game. Love it. I love it, and I I'm all for that. I, I largely agree. You know, I certainly agree with the issue of if you're going to bring in that type, it should be. And I'm and I'm accustomed from the old days of me, it being entangled in the campaign in a deep way. Yeah. So a lot of those you know, new secondary classes, uh, such as illusionists or druids or bards or assassins, right? When they were originally written up, they had a lot of in-campaign detail, but there was a maximum level and who was the chief and how many of each level could exist. And you'd have to fight the next level up to a tournament to replace yourself as the, you know, one out of seven master druids or something like that. And that was a lot of really got my imagination fired up. Mm. Um, and I think that like, like my instinct is if you're going to bring in some secondary class like that, it should be tied heavily into the campaign. Yeah. And if you, if you don't, then I agree, it comes off as kind of a, kind of a, 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 a lukewarm, uh, version yeah. of what you're trying to bring out. Yeah. It's right. like, you know, one thing you mentioned was like, what, what type of artistry does the bard have? And right at the moment on screen, we're looking at, um, uh, this, um, this painting, it's called The Bard by John Martin. I think it was painted in 1817. And it's interesting that a lot of the art at the time, so this is, so if you look really closely up on that mountainside, uh, the bard in question is an old man, has white flowing hair, is carrying a harp. And at least at the time, that was the common concept for bards, is they tended to be old or ancient and flowing white hair. And they all had harps. That was the canonical instrument for bards to begin with. And if you look at the Schwegman article, Along with the bard class, I'm kind of going off tangent here, I apologize. So along with the bard class, he also introduced five new magic items. And they were specifically to be used by bards. And they were all five harps. Like every single instrument to begin with was a harp, as a matter of fact. Um, and then why five? Okay, and then here's a picture of Orpheus, which is great. Also thought, with a harp, yep, of course. Yep, yep, right? One, yep. Um, and one of our, one of our uh, Joshua, a couple minutes ago, mentioned Orpheus might be the, the, the initial mythical bard, possibly. Um, and so uh, initially, the Irish bard was supposed to have a harp. That was, that was how you sang. And mm -hmm. over time, you know, with, with first edition, Gygax distinguished the instruments. So you could have, you could, the magical items might be a harp or a lute or a lyre or something else. And they were all, you know, kind of stringed instruments. And, you know, here we are with 5th edition now, and you can be anything you want to be. You can be a juggler. You can be a flutist. You can be a, 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 a penist. Um, um, and, uh, and it's interesting how these things, you know, on the one hand, they get disconnected from the deep cultural history in order to open up other options in the game. And I wrestle with that. I honestly yeah. wrestle about whether that's, whether that's gaining, uh, whether that's uh, a plus or a minus net. Um, and I, I, I um, in, in some ways it's nice, and in some ways I'm troubled by that. For me, I think that one of the major draws of old school is simplification. Simplification of the rules so that you can have room to one-off establish things for the needs of your campaign. And I feel like that's the direction I want to lean, is I, I don't want 
don't want systemization of this stuff, right? I want to incorporate it into the into the campaign world in an, in a meaningful way to my campaign, which means you can't possibly have pre considered it and written it all down. Um, but you go back to my original example of running a BX campaign, and we had a, a, a people wanting to play Rangers and Druids, and uh, not Rangers and Druids, Rangers and Paladins. And I actually immediately then incorporated that into the backstory of the game where there was two warring princes trying to um, uh, trying to establish themselves as the rightful ruler of the land, and one of them was backed by a group called the Rangers, and one of them was backed by a group called the Paladins. You know, one saying divine right, and one saying, you know, uh, that... Uh, um, that uh, oh, I can't remember their argument. Something about... Uh, it was more magically induced, that, that he was uh, more of a scholar. More of a scholar, and had therefore, uh, you know, better, better connect into... Uh, the actual needs of the people. Anyway, um, so I love that. And again, the more the more I dig into that, I'm like, that's cool. And I want and I want that stuff in my campaign. And do I need rules where you have a special chart that says you have a one in six chance of uh, being able to forage for food in the forest? Eh, eh, I, don't, I don't think I need. That's a that's a I, random you know, I, ability of some argument. creature. It's a strong yeah, argument. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a strong argument. Now, obviously, we were just talking to uh, Jim and Pruitt last week about uh, you know their weird, weird wastelands and how they feel that classic D anD D has some ways that they could improve the wilderness game. Mm -hmm. And so, I think a lot of us agree that it wasn't perfect, uh, and look for different ways of massaging the wilderness game that you're talking about there for rangers. So. Uh, Certainly, so we might go back to last week's episode and think about what Jim and Pruitt said about that. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hmm. 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 All right. Now, so, one, okay, so one thing I want to go ahead, Paul. I was, I was going to bring us forward now. So now, now we're talking about 5th edition. I want to talk about 5th edition because you and I have a shared experience of Bards in 5th edition, which is from the Big Bad, where we had a character yes. Yes. Uh, in the Big Bad, an option for a Bard. Um, uh, what was that character's name? Was, uh, uh, Isaglin of the Magic Loot. Isaglin of the Magic Loot, which was not a super popular choice, right? That was one of the interesting things Correct. that come out of the Big Bad is we Correct. kind of tracked uh, how many people chose the different characters. And Isaglin yeah. showed up in one episode? Was it only a single episode? Jeez, you might be Six, right. Yeah, I think it was maybe one. Uh, to great effect was a very Correct. useful, yes. highly right. useful, highly prized character in that game. I was pretty unhappy with that, but yes, that's <laughs> a true statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so now in fifth edition, we see that that bard song has translated into bardic inspiration, right? Uh, yes. So it's not just an always on thing, right? You only get so many uses per day, and then it has a little more mechanization of uh, you get extra dice and etc. It's not flat plus one, right. so it's a little more, a little more crunchy, a little more interesting, perhaps a little more exciting because there's dice rolling involved. That's always good. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to come. I, mean, with, uh, I will say that it's been largely tuned down in that that you know fifth edition is the one edition that has removed their general charming ability. Yeah. Yeah, but that I think feel like that jibes well with our desire to just add to rely on spells, right? It, it is, I, yes, you're right. I think you're it right. is odd to have a character who just has an always on charming ability because it kind of does. Um, uh, it takes away a little bit, I think, from those who need spells to power that same effect. I can see that. I mean, you know, if the, if you know if the bard has generally fewer spells, but then also has this extra uh, on demand or certain number mm -hmm. of times per day charming ability, I can see it. I'm not. I'm not appalled. Yeah, but by no, that. my my argument was was more that that last detail of always on versus uses per day. That like an always on, just like you're always constantly charming everyone. Like that, that feels a little campaign breaking. But maybe it was better to swallow because again, you had to make your way through a bunch of other classes first. So by the time you got that ability, you were pretty freaking high level. Correct, correct. I will say in the earliest editions, the ch the charming ability always had a daily limit. Oh, did it? Okay. So original for yeah, they did actually always have a daily limit. Uh, like, like to begin with, the very, and the initial thing was you could use it once per once per day per level. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and of course, this also feeds in to the ongoing debate we have about what is the effect of charm, <laughs> which, which turns out to be the, the very first debate ever held in D&D, actually. It was yeah. exactly how strong is the first level charm person, a debate <laughs> which continues since 1975 today. Um, and yep. once again, the bard language is yet another, I don't know, third or fourth branch of you can, you can to begin with, you can mesmerize people, they will, they will, they will stop acting and then you can hit them with a suggestion. Um, so it was, so it was fairly, you know, to anybody in a big area. So it was fairly powerful. Um, and it was, it was limited like a spell a certain number of times per day. Uh, now again, you and I, the, the, the first time that I think you and I actually played with a bard was in third edition and there, I believe they could do their plus one inspiration all the time. All the time. Yep. Uh, hence the, hence the, hence the yelling of bard song, bard song all the time. Um, right, right. Uh, and not not having played with those earliest editions, we're kind of off the radar about exactly how powerful they were. <laughs> let me throw let me throw out one let me throw out one thing. So um, <clears throat> as, as soon as I started talking about like my instinct for bards, as far as I might have them do advanced training before they join the organization, if you're familiar with first edition, of course you know where I'm getting that idea from, because when Gygax wrote the first edition player's handbook, the bard class was in a special appendix. It wasn't in the main body of the book, it was in a special appendix. It had it was labeled as optional. It had a whole bunch of warning flags around it. Mm. And Gygax wrote, it is often not allowed by dungeon masters, is what he wrote. <gasps> and, and you couldn't start off as a bard. It was yep. not a class that you could start off as first level at. So you had to engage with what was technically called the dual classing rules is you had to start off with a fighter and you had to level up your fighter to at least fifth level. And then you had to switch to a thief and you had to go through the whole game again, as if you were a thief until you were at least sixth level. And then at that point, then you could shift a third time and actually enter the bard class. And at that point you would retain all your fighting fighter ability. You'd retain all your thief thieving skills. And now Suddenly, you got the you got the charm ability, you got the the magical lore ability, um, and you started gaining druid spells <clears throat> at the time. Interestingly, in the in the original D and D version, they gained magic user spells, and at the time, the whole idea of druids actually was was evolving. Uh, but at least in first edition, they were getting uh, they were getting druid spells. So <clears throat> it's an interesting initial case because in addition to this special like it's the apex predator and you actually have to play the whole game through twice before you're even allowed to become a bard. Um, it also introduced, that was the initial seed of this idea of go through some class in order to gain another class. Yeah. And of course in the third edition game, right, that blossomed into this whole subsystem called prestige classes. And that was actually a major selling. Like a lot of the supplements in third edition were selling new prestige classes mm-hmm that you had to go through some, some initial class to level five in order to gain. And you, you get a little bit, you get a little bit of that sense still today in fifth edition with paths. What's the general term for that in fifth? So you get to like fourth level and now you make a choice. Oh, is there a term for that? I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a general term for it or not. But yeah, yeah, yeah I hear I what you're talking about. There's a general term for that. Like, like when, the, when the rogue decides to become an arcane trickster right. or... Uh, yep, exactly. Yep, yep. yep. Exactly. And, um, and for, you know, for what it's worth, like with the, with the fifth edition bard class, those paths are called colleges. And there's a, there's a historical precedent for that. So if you read the 1738 book, right, as bards historically or mythologically went through their 20 years of seminary training under druids, they had seven uh, degrees that they had to earn actually, uh, that were technically called colleges. And so in the uh, zero and first edition, that was very much baked into the class, where at a particular level, you were in a particular college and uh, uh, unlocked the ability to use one of the magic, one of the special barred magic items, and you don't have exactly the same thing today, but that's the ideas carried through into the fifth edition bard paths are called colleges. Hmm. Don't have the same name as historically. Again, zero edition, first edition, they use the historical names of the colleges, which are hard to pronounce, as you saw earlier. Um, 
But it, again, that's an interesting little piece of DNA that is still in the game in fifth edition. So let me let me go back a little bit here, Dan. Did you did you ever play a first edition game where somebody pursued the dual classing system, whether it was to reach Bard or not? I don't think so. And you know, it's an interesting question because part of the problem with that is that the text for that is buried, you know, way deep in a whole bunch of text. So in order in order to even know that that option exists, the DM either has to tell you somehow or someone has to comprehensively read the entire book all the way into appendix two. And like, as we discussed on our read the DM guide uh, episode, not everybody does that. So I'm not entirely sure any of my players even knew that was an option. <laughs> I feel like I saw it most in, like I never saw any player actually try to pursue it from the beginning. Um, yeah. I mostly saw it in cases where uh, maybe we're starting a, a new campaign at a higher level. Okay, we're all going to make fifth or sixth level characters or something. And so then somebody would say, well, could I play a dual class and, you know, mm. let me kind of retroactively consider if everyone else got this many experience points, how, how would I, how would my path have gone to dual class? And, and the thing was, it always felt very convoluted and strange and not worth it. And then like, like somebody did a bunch of math on the back of a napkin and when it finally was like, yeah, screw it. It's too complicated. <laughs> Just going to play a fighter. <laughs> I, you know, I, it's funny you remember that because I, you know, at one point I made a, um, I think I made a first edition uh, NPC generator, I think, mm -hmm. right? And somewhere in the guts of it, there was spreadsheet work to determine what experience point number would have possibly allowed you to graduate from fighter to thief at this level versus this level. Um, and I've, 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 I've done that. I've done that math. You know, I mean, a couple of minutes ago, I believe it was David in the chat who, who said, like, I don't mind feats, but I really hate feat trees. And one of the real cancers on third edition, I would say, was this need to pre-plan your character's path from level one to 20, as far as what class would they take and what skills would they get and what feats would unlock other feats. And so you knew, you know, I, th I think, you know, you and I probably agree, Paul, in completely antithetical to old school style, you had to have a plan for your character's progression from birth to death. Yeah. Because you had to know where you wanted to be at level 20 and you had to start planning for that at level one to know what skills and feats you were going to take. And that was A, very complicated, and B, kind of spoiled the whole mystery of where the campaign leads us next uh, improvisationally. Yeah. And so I agree that those systems that have this like network of prerequisites become very entangled and fundamentally a bad thing yeah. in, you know, in that way, I'd actually look at fifth editions paths and don't mind is like, there's one, there's a very simple criteria. You need to get the fourth level or whatever it is. Yeah. And that level of simplicity, there actually is something to uh, something to praise for that. It's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, in, in fifth edition, uh, we see this. You know, there's, there's certain types of players who just really, really dig that, really like the the fine tuning specialization of their character, yeah. and contemplating all the possible options and and pre planning out the whole thing. Uh, when we hear fifth edition players talk about it, they talk about their build, right? What's your build? Okay. And I remember, yeah. uh, I remember again running games back at PAX Unplugged where um, we had some pre made. Fifth edition characters, and I remember getting the feedback of somebody looking at it and going, "Oh, I really like this build, except I would have changed this to this and this to that." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 the funny thing is, it was a little antithetical to the way I think you and I play, because I looked at it and been like, "Well, I didn't make choices based on like getting the numbers amazing. I made choices that made sense for the background of this character." Um, you know, which you know, in retrospect, like that's how you and I do it. For uh, I'm reminded of how we. Both you and I independently, I think when we were when we were trying to run the A series modules using older editions, you're looking at the pre generated characters and you have like, oh, here's an illusionist, and we thought, well, O D and D or BX doesn't have an illusionist, but I bet I could make a magic user with a specific spell selection and it's pretty close. Um, I agree. I like that. Yeah. And it's largely how we did it for the, the characters, uh, the character bench on the big bad too. Right. And we had some feedback from more experienced fifth edition players about, you know, you could tweak it like this, you could tweak it like this. And we did actually use some of those suggestions uh, um, to, to improve the characters. But again, the idea was 
who is the character first. Right. Um, and you know, you, and it's interesting because specifically for the for the case of our bard, Isaglin, it was the one single character where I dug into the fifth edition feats in order to permit her to carry a two handed sword and thereby match the miniature that we picked out, right. which looked really super cool, a bard carrying around a two-handed sword. Right. Um, right. And is that the best way of using the bardic, you know, a bard leveling up? Probably, you know, maybe not, but it was super cool and I and I liked, I enjoyed it. So right. Right. yeah, which I, I, feel think... that's, I feel that's very old school. Yeah, yeah. So is that is that the problem ultimately with things like branching feet trees and et cetera, that, that like, it promotes that that optimization of character ahead of time, rather than allowing the campaign to influence your choices and and dictate. Oh well, this this makes sense for the character. I, I certainly think so, and you know I think that fifth edition has gone in a better direction than third. I, third had yeah. third has really super entangled on that level. You you're, almost you're, couldn't engage with the game without doing that. You're speaking specifically of stuff like the. Uh, the prestige classes where you're like okay, oh, yeah. I have yeah. these goals I have to hit X Y and Z mm -hmm. or I'm not going to make it into my prestige class exactly right. I agree I like I do like that in fifth edition you have that that simply that every character class seems to have like this natural break of at fourth level okay you get to make a choice you get A B or C which do you want uh, yeah. <laughs> I got to apologize to David because a couple minutes ago I accidentally said he was okay with feats, and I, th I think I misquoted somebody else. So I apologize for that. I apologize. I apologize to David for using feats in my games. <laughs> Not that you'll stop using them. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I actually, I, I don't. You know, I kind of like having <clears throat> options. You know, more. I like having more options at higher levels. Uh, I don't like the prere the prerequisite feet trees. That was obviously obviously really didn't work in third edition. And so simplifying it, making some way that you can pick these options, you know, when you get to a higher level without a whole bunch of advanced advanced planning makes sense. And you know, I I enjoy looking at original D and D where there were more spells at higher levels mm -hmm. compared to first. And when, you know, starting with first edition, when they flipped that and you had more, a larger spell list at first level that the new player would have to spend time, um, uh, you know, assessing and deciding from. Mm. Um, I, pr I prefer having a relatively small number of options for new players at first level and then have more options at higher levels. And if something like bards become an option at a higher level, uh, that actually feels that feels right to me for a number of reasons because they're prestigious and they're powerful and they're an option I don't want to put in front of players that are completely new to the game. But it shouldn't be entangled with a whole bunch of advanced choices that you have to be pre-planning from the first point because that actually breaks the whole point because because if it's an option for a higher level, why do I have to learn about it at first level? That's that breaks the whole point. <laughs> We've gone down an odd tangent here, Dan, and we're we're running close to the wire here on time. So I want to bring it back to Bards. Do you have any? Yeah, I know that I know that I have a lot of visual aids here that we didn't get to. So does there any stuff that you were really hoping to get to on Bards that we we have missed? Throw up um, Hodags. So there there is a. I mean, I I, I said we were going to discuss how thirsty do you like your Bards, right? <laughs> this was promise. That was clearly promise in the that opening of the episode. Yep. Yep. So, uh, like number eight, I think is. Uh, I don't have numbers um, here. You're gonna have to. Be uh, more it's, it's a black and white photo with some red text. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this was a uh, this was a meme uh, made by a gentleman named Hodag on RPG Twitter, and uh, he's taken the illustration of treasure being chopped up at the at the very end of the first edition player's handbook. Lovely piece of art. Um, where uh, at, at the table, the four characters, one is saying, oh, Lord, and the second one's saying, he's at it again, and the wizard is pontificating, saying, horny bards is a new trope, and it wasn't popular in early editions. And the fourth character is rolling their eyes. Um, so I, I personally laugh at this pretty hard, because, yeah, um, thinking about first edition, early edition, first edition bards, they weren't, you know, horny goofballs. They were a platoon of Sherman tanks. And... <laughs> For me, I kind of like, you know, I, you know, may, this is a, this is a point where I might be nostalgic about, I might not be thinking clearly, or I might okay. be replaced by a doppelganger. I don't know. Okay. But I actually kind of like the idea of at least bards coming in at a higher level 
being an option that maybe you can transfer to fairly easily, accessing at a higher level, and then being super powerful and super hooked into the campaign world at a very essential level and being one step below the kings and being, you know, basically a roaming judge dread in D&D. Mm -hmm. That that seems more that to me that seems more interesting than just a weak magic user. My my my, my argument is that that precisely opens the door for what we were just talking about before where someone's starting the game thinking I would like to eventually become a bard. Ergo, I have to plan my entire path out uh, well in advance. It, it, keep it keep it lightweight. I think I think that the I think that maybe the the first edition uh, aspect that already was too complicated. Mm. Uh, I totally respect that, and I and and that's why I kind of look fondly at uh, fifth edition, where there's just like one moment where you make a choice. In fifth edition, you don't need to pick feats, you don't need to pick skills. It's just you get to a particular level, and now this particular option becomes available. Maybe in the campaign, <clears throat> you need to quest for it. Maybe there's a hidden organization in the campaign in a distant land, and you need to go there and you need to find them, and then you're then you're allowed to, to transition to the second class. Uh, totally agree. Having a whole bunch of prerequisites doesn't work, and I'm not in favor of that. Well, let me let me let me ask this because your teaser here was uh, about how thirsty do you like your bards, and I want to propose this: Is it not problematic that we are pushing this idea? that a specific character type known for their ability to influence the behavior of others through magical means uh, is more sexually promiscuous than other character types. Uh, do you really want to go down the road of a character who is essentially delivering uh, auditory-induced rehypnol? Wow, content war, dude! <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I'm just saying, if the whole character trope is that they're able to charm people, hmm, I don't know that I like this road. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, wow. I, that one I'm going to have to think about. Uh, obviously, got to be, you know, you're going to, I'm assuming again that it's tuned into your campaign. I'm yeah. assuming, you know, that you're going to find something that y your players are okay with. Uh, you know, I don't, you know, everything turns into a horror story. <laughs> That's, I, that, it sounds potentially horrible and, and yeah. therefore potentially legitimate in-game, uh, 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 you know, uh, storyline. Yikes. Yikes. Make sure, everybody's on, make sure everybody's on board with that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds, yeah. Like, sounds like maybe a chaotic bard that needs to get taken down. Oh my goodness! Now, now that oh my my brain is now assaulted by ideas of really inappropriate uh, uh, campaigns featuring certain villain types. Uh, but I suppose there's there's plenty of uh, precedent for that with uh, you know vampires and the like. Of yeah, you know, that's yeah. that's what it was all about. They were predators. Not one, one recommending type of another. For everybody. Yeah, Not recommending no. that you 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 throw something like that at uh, uh, players that are new to the game that you don't know where their uh, where their uh, uh, where their taste level is, uh, so don't surprise somebody with that. No, uh, no, no. But uh, uh, yeah. when we talk when we talk more about Appendix N later on, we're going to be talking. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be talking more about the, the the eldritch horrible roots of D and D, and that's that's potentially part of some people's games. <laughs> All right, thanks, Paul. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to, I didn't to bring it. I didn't mean to bring it. Uh, <laughs> Bring it in such a serious tone. Uh, <laughs> mostly trying to make a terrible joke here. Uh, um, yeah, fascinating. I'm definitely. famously almost without any humor at all, so <laughs> it's probably probably my bad. Oh dear. And I suppose it ultimately brings us right back to the original argument of well, how effective is charm anyway? Yeah. How effective is charm? Yeah. Are you a Swansonite or a Johnstonian? Ooh, ooh. Excellent. That sounds like a whole other topic. Uh, right, right. Uh, Check out my blog from last week, and you know what we're talking about. Um, and I will also say that I do. I, you know, I, I personally also like uh, mater D and D material that is that is uh, tied directly into cultural and historical resources. Mm -hmm. I like it when books uh, say out loud 
what uh, references and what books are we thinking about? How are we going to, you know, transition them into game terms? I, you know, in the, the earliest editions had that. The original D&D article, first edition, second edition, uh, had the sidebars about what you're citing. And that all kind of went away as of uh, third, fourth, or fifth edition. And I, I, I kind of like having the opportunity to have some kind of appendix, some kind of bibliography to know where to look for more and learn more about world culture, uh, you know, springboarding and feeding back into my D&D games. And that's the thing that I also really appreciate in the, the earliest editions, which I, you know, aren't actually in the books now. Hmm. All right. Well, folks, uh, that's about our time. Uh, if you have any thoughts on bards, uh, how to use them in old school games, whether you should, uh, what uh, you know, how the, how they've changed over the time, what what happened to them, when did they turn from Sherman tanks into uh, into singing goofballs? Uh, you know, leave us leave us some comments in the video below. We'd love to hear from you. Um, or if there are other particular classes like the bard uh, that uh, maybe feel a little controversial that you'd love to hear us cover. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, mention that in the comments, and uh, hopefully it will springboard into a new, a whole new discussion down the road. Definitely. I, I personally would really look forward to that, actually. Yeah. And also remember that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us on places like YouTube and Twitch and Twitter and Facebook and GitHub. And we do have the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites, so please look for us there. If you would prefer to listen to our show in audio-only podcast format, perhaps on your commute or while you're out mowing the lawn, uh, you can find those files uh, on our website at wanderingdms.com. Uh, you can also find us on various third-party podcast carriers like uh, Google Podcast and iTunes and Spotify. If you're listening to us from one of those third-party carriers, please take a moment to rate and review our show on that site. That helps other users of that platform find us, and we really appreciate it. We really do. Uh, look for upcoming shows this week on the Wandering DMs channel. Thursday, Paul will be back playing as a player uh, in a second episode of uh, your vacation game, uh, playing the Go Go Golf Fantasy Golfing. I mean, I wouldn't have picked that, but but you guys are playing a, a comedy fantasy golfing game with uh, monsters and goblins and talking golf balls and things like that. And I was yep. watching and I was laughing all the way through last Thursday. So I will be looking forward to Thursday at 8 for another round of uh, Go Go Golf with Christian DMing. <laughs> that will be, uh, that will be the exciting back. conclusion of that. Uh, so we have one more week of that before we return back to our normal our normal campaign. Very good. The exciting conclusion to Go Go Golf. And Isabel and I should be back on Saturday with another round of uh, Book of War as Isabel has been uh, catching up. I, I, I thought I had a really safe lead on the series. And then our patron seeker has been feeding her armies the last couple of episodes, and she's been catching up with me. So she won one more win, and Isabel will have caught up with me in the season rankings. And I'm highly unhappy about that. I am very, <laughs> I am very not fond of that. But what are you going to do? Our patrons are great, and they're smart, and they're tasteful, and they're hard to beat. And if you're in a position where you would like to join our patrons, you can go to patreon.com slash wandering DMs and a whole bunch of benefits in the tiers there, such as discounts on merch, access to our private Discord server where there's ongoing conversations about oftentimes how to beat Dan at Duck of War, apparently, um, <laughs> and uh, backstage uh, videos on a monthly basis and access to surveys on polls on things you'd like to see in upcoming shows like what subclass would you like us to talk about next time? And also after party chat, after every Sunday show, we get on Discord in a video chat with our best patrons and we have a wonderful time and continue the conversation right after the show, as a matter of fact. Uh, is that, did I, is that one, of, one of my, is that basically it, Paul? You're good, Dan. <laughs> oh my goodness. Fantastic. I just leveled up. Awesome. So don't forget, we, the Wandering DMs, are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So we do hope that you'll join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.